insights, solutions, and networking all come together at RSA Conference. Join a global cybersecurity community at rsaconference.com forward slash ITSP MAG24. Welcome to the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. You're listening to a new Redefining Cybersecurity Podcast with Sean Martin. Have you ever thought that we're selling cybersecurity insincerely, buying it indiscriminately, and deploying it ineffectively? Well, perhaps we are. Let's look at how we can organize a successful information security program that integrates business culture with people, process, and technology to drive growth and protect business value. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Imperva is the cybersecurity leader whose mission is to protect data and all paths to it with a suite of integrated application and data security solutions. Learn more at imperva.com. Devo unlocks the full value of machine data for the world's most instrumented enterprises. The Devo Data Analytics Platform addresses the explosion in volume of machine data and the crushing demands of algorithms and automation. Learn more at devo.com. Hello, everybody. You're very welcome to a new episode of Redefining Cybersecurity here on the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. This is Sean Martin, your host, where I get to talk to all kinds of cool people who are much times, many times, much smarter than myself, <laughs> thankfully, and uh, do a lot of research and have a lot of insights into things that help us run our businesses uh, more securely so we can not just protect the revenue that we generate, but to actually help the business grow and reach their their uh, growth objectives and uh, bottom line is one thing and if you're spending money uh, paying ransomware you're not uh, you're not helping the bottom line <laughs> even if you do help things grow uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about today is the, the state of ransomware and kind of the culture around that and and maybe some trends that uh, we're seeing that might change how we how we view and address and respond to ransomware attacks. And I'm thrilled to have uh, Ari Schwartz on. Ari, thanks for thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Sean. And this was, uh, as many of my conversations seem to be these days, uh, is driven by a post that you made, uh, which was a result of an article or a blog that you wrote uh, the, titled The Path to Banning Ransomware Payments. I thought this is an interesting topic. Let's see if Ari is willing to uh, join me for a chat and, and you agreed. So thanks for uh, thanks for joining me for this. I'm, I'm excited to get into the, the nuts and bolts of it. Um, before we do, a few words from you, kind of a view of your background, some of the things you've been involved with, and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Sure. Uh, so I uh, started working on tech policy um, probably around, you know, uh, um, about almost uh, 30 years ago and then uh, came to Washington a couple of years after working in Boston for a while with a bunch of nonprofits. And then uh, uh, my first uh, work that I did uh, led to some work on privacy and security, worked at the Center for Democracy and Technology for 12 years, and then uh, moved into government and worked uh, at NIST for uh, several years. And then uh, from there was uh, detailed to the uh, secretary's office to be the tech advisor to the secretary. And then uh, came to, uh, uh, from there was uh, moved to the White House and National Security Council staff and was there for two and a half years. Um, and uh, when I left there, I moved, uh, I got, uh, I was contacted by uh, an old friend of mine who was at a, a firm called Venable, which is a law firm. Uh, and. Uh, asked me to build a, a, a consulting team there uh, here uh, of non-lawyers. So we're a bunch of non-lawyers at a law firm uh, that we do policy and we do uh, some operational work as well. And, uh, you know, really pulling together lots of other companies and trying to come up with solutions in this space is part of what we do, um, as well as working with the clients of the firm and individual companies on their policies or, uh, or processes. Um, and so uh, we, 
you know, one of the groups that we worked with uh, is, is the Institute for um, Security and Technology. They built this um, ransomware task force um, in 2020. Um, it, well, it started around then, and uh, we were active in that from the beginning. Um, and one of the issues that came up there was uh, ransomware payments. We had had, obviously, working somewhere with working with a bunch of clients um, in this space uh, already knew a good deal about ransomware, uh, at least how the payment side work and how people negotiated it and how, what insurance companies, how to work with insurance companies on it. Um, almost everyone in that at that point, I mean, that was like, you know, as things were changing, almost everyone at that point uh, uh, was paying ransoms. And um, there was a viewpoint, uh, well, from I think most of the people in the task force, like we're not at the point where if you ban payment today, like that would be a disaster for everybody. Uh, and I was certainly of that camp, but I did su suggest that, you know, it should be the goal of governments to get to the point where we could ban ransomware, right? Like e payments of ransomware and ban ransom, you know, but th so that people wouldn't be paying. Um, and that should really be the goal. And uh, really we have to build a path there. And the first steps of that are what the ransomware, the, the original version of the ransomware task force focused on um, with it some point saying basically at some point governments are going to have to ban it. So one, one of the things, and then, and I found this year that really we had gotten to a point where a lot less people are paying, you know, it's a, in fact, if you read some of the reports that suggest it's under 50%, I would say it's probably right around 50% from what I've seen in the, in the field. Um, you know, a lot of those payments now are about more about extortion than about, uh, locking, just locking down computers, but instead of, you know, uh, we have this information on you and uh, we're going to send it out is what more of those payments are about. So, um, so the, the kind of the, it has changed uh, what the, with the types of payments we're seeing. Um, and I think we're at a point now where we can kind of have a conversation on what it might look like. And that's really, and, and a lot of there's, there, there was a, uh, in November, December, I, I was contacted several times by people talking about, um, well, maybe we should ban ransomware now. And I think um, I wanted to kind of lay out in this paper a little bit more of how we get there um, and what, and thinking about having thought about it for the last three years, you know, knowing that we're going to need this path eventually. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I had the pleasure of uh, speaking with Sean Tuma uh, the other day, who's also at a law firm looking at this uh, operationally speaking. Now, he, he and I were talking more around broader risk management and security operations and incident response and the connection to, to cyber insurance. And he, he confirmed your point and, and also a stat that, that's in the article or the blog that you wrote uh, that less, less, and less entities are paying. Um, we didn't talk about the amounts, but uh, the, the amounts seem to be going up, even the though are people up. are paying. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so it was interesting that, that those things jive. Um, what I want to do is maybe kind of talk through why maybe what, what Sean suggested is that organizations are better prepared, right? So uh, they have the backups to recover. They have some technologies and controls in place to mitigate the, the likelihood of, of compromise. I'd like to get your perspective. What, why fewer are paying? Are they, are they more prepared? And then what about the I other think, half? I think they are more prepared. I think if people are more prepared, I think there has been a new focus from government and from uh, private sector on combating ransomware. So there's a lot more information being shared about the threat actors and about their techniques, um, a lot more tools being built to stop the specific techniques that we saw in the past. So that's why you see a shift in the, in the way that the uh, what the what the actors are doing. Um, that we've seen some lot less reputable people or people who um, in, in, in the, the bad where the bad guys are uh, um, basically not honoring, not coming back or so if you pay them, they can just come right back. Right. And so we've seen some of that. We've seen cases where the keys don't work when you get them, even though you paid for them, um, which may or may not be the fault of the, the, the bad guy. I mean, they might think they're giving you a key that works, but because of the changes that they've made in the technology over time, it doesn't work. So, um, you know, that I think we've seen some of that and that kind of it plays into the decision making as well. Uh, but I do think there is better prepare, 
but better preparation, there's better backups, there's better segmentation, which plays into it too, where we see sometimes uh, um, cases where uh, customers say, well, it's always, if I'm going to be losing all my old mail, I don't really care that much, right? I'm not going to pay that much money and, and run the risks of that for um, for just that, just my, you know, archive mail. Um, so if, if you have segmentation, you get a little bit better results out of that. Um, so, but backups obviously are key there too. And that's what uh, uh, Cover says in their report about this uh, is that the backups play a key role. Um, and I think that's true too. So um, yeah, so I think that those are the main reasons, but you know, again, people are still paying. So it's not as though it's uh, right. 100% there, but it's gotten much better. So I think the, those two points, there's, a, there's the economic, which kind of touched on, and there's the, I don't think we really said it directly, but the, the moral, and I'm looking at your imperatives that you wrote about. Yeah, so clearly yeah. economic is a driver. Um, <clears throat> people might just say, I, I have the backups and I'm not going to pay, or even if I don't I'm recover, I'm just going to figure a different way out. Then there's the middle one of the national security imperative, which I don't know how many people Care about that? Clearly, there's still. Yeah, this is, the imperatives are more why governments, because I think that from the private sector point of view, um, the, the, it's kind of like, well, we'll just work this out over time. Over time, it'll just drift down slowly. Um, you know, let us continue to pay. We've basically got a, We're moving in the right direction. It might take a while. We might never actually get to zero, but we can keep it at a low level. And uh, I'm trying to say with those with this argument, like that, that governments are. Are always going to feel the need to, to want to ban the payments, and there's three reasons for that. So um, the first one, it, 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 I'll go. Uh, oh, the first one it, that I have listed is the um, is the moral imperative, right? And that idea is, you know, um, but as you pay, you're actually funding other people. You're funding uh, to, you're funding the criminals, the other people to be victim, victims of the crime. Right, you're paying the bad you're paying the bad guys to increase the crime, um, and so uh, it is better for society to stop it um, in in that way. And so, if you think of what governments are there for, it's like just a basic tenet of what governments exist for is to stop situations where we have that kind of uh, um, uh, moral imperative to capital. And this is like goes back to Kant, Immanuel Kant, right? So I got to use some uh, uh, things <laughs> things you learned in undergrad, right? Like uh, there you go. Uh, we talk about the Kantian moral imperative, right? Uh, this is just a classic case of that, right? Where um, uh, do you want you want when we when we when government when the rational act in a situation is to do the thing that's wrong for society, and everyone has to do that, it's government's job to come in and step in and make sure that uh, it is the, not the wrong thing to do. That the the rational thing to do is the right thing for society, right? So is the way to put that. Um, so uh, that's uh, where we see that, um, you know, uh, it, some people might make that determination on their own that they shouldn't do it. But for the most case, that's not going to be their driver. They're going to make the rational decision, which in, in which in 2020 always was to pay. Now there's a little bit more of a choice in the situation. Um, but yeah. the, that, that moral imperative still exists in a lot of cases. Then there's a the national security imperatives from a government's point of view. And so, and this is why governments didn't care, right? A lot of governments didn't care until uh, 2021 or so when they started to see that this was funding government actions mm. uh, in particular. And so uh, yeah. particularly we saw, there was discussion about this with North Korea, that North Korea, um, North Korean actors were involved um, and looking to make money off of ransomware. Um, but we, we've also seen it from some of the actors that work with Russia. Even if the Russian government isn't actively using it to fund the Russian government, they might be using it. The, the actors that spend most of their time in ransomware can come over and help the Russian government with something else on the side, or the Chinese or the Iranians. We've seen flirt with it. So uh, I think there, it is uh, you know, something that has come up quite a bit, and that got governments a lot more interested, and it gets uh, national security side of the house uh, more active on the issue. And they're always looking, you know, if we can put, come in with a law to solve the situation, they're going to they're going to be in favor of that. And then the economic one, which I think is the more straightforward one for most people, which is just a total drain on uh, the, the society. It's all it's all black market. You yeah. know, no no upside for most uh, legitimate economy. So all three of those things, I think, play into the way a government thinks about it. Now, 
from again the rational thing to do in 2020 was to pay <laughs> right even despite all those things right and that's really i think the driver that where the tension comes in is you know people are thinking about this from a rational perspective uh totally rational perspective i mean that from a, a f philosophical sense of the word um not the crazy not crazy sense of the, the way it's generally used in society right so um, but it, the rational act is was to pay and now we're getting to the point where that may or may not be the case and the question is how do we tip it a little bit more so that it's not the rational thing to do anymore so that more yeah. people start doing it. and then we can get that number down uh with gov with some government action involved faster than it would just on its own yeah and let, let's talk through there, there are four points there um that that you suggest lead us to a place where where it becomes rational right we we can we reach a point where the right and expected and comfortable we'll say <laughs> thing to do yeah. is to not pay and uh the the government gets involved well, yeah, to help yeah, with that so, uh, yeah ransomware bans right they think well you're gonna go to jail right. if you pay the fine right and i think and and some people have suggested that directly like yeah if you pay a fine if you pay right. i mean or you pay the ransomware you, you you should go straight to jail uh um for paying the ransomware that would solve the problem we made it a criminal act um i don't like the idea of criminalizing uh the way a victim has to respond and even for the government to kind of make that determination especially when it has been the rational thing to do for until now right what, like no other choice except the yeah except the one that now is unlawful and i can one can be penalized for it <laughs> that's right not, both, both, right. both so, situations are bad yeah i think uh if we think of it more of it as a civil situation right where we can come up with actions where it's a fine or it's a uh, or or other things that we have, people have to do if um they're you know they're, uh, they're so that there's other downsides um to their action um then they might weigh it differently right and and especially uh let's so we'll start with reporting which um sure. you know, the u.s government has already decided to move towards for critical infrastructure at least um that people have to report ransomware payments so um we're already moving in that direction um and then uh the second one that i have there that, that i don't think has gotten had people i hadn't heard before i this but has come up in other contexts is to have government security oversight for companies that pay so if you pay a ransom that's fine but then you also enter into a um 20-year agreement with the F federal trade commission as they do for uh binding you know binding decisions binding uh agreements that they come into with companies that have had big security problems in the past um have a pattern or practice of uh lack of security right um so I give the Federal Trade Commission as an example. There could be some other government agency, probably, and and um, but I like the idea of uh, having it be an independent regulatory body that is the one that's kind of overseeing that uh, effort, and um, you know ha have them make that determination and run that program, especially one that has had prog um, has had uh, success doing that in the past. Um, then the other one is the one I raised before, where we, you could give fines, right? You could just add in, you know, some flat amount, or it could be the same amount that you pay the criminal. You have to pay to the to the federal government, and that's used into the program for uh, helping uh, companies turn around their security and um, put back into security, et cetera. And then for criminal charges, uh, is the last one I have on there. And again, I don't like the idea of. Uh, victimizing people what i would say is if you purposely tried to subvert this system you weren't reporting it and you were purposely trying to shove this underground then it becomes a criminal case so uh we're, we're trying to get this all above board as much as we can turn it more into a civil act um and uh etc no i'm, I'm going to raise this point it's not in your list um I'll, I'll, i believe all four let me double check it <laughs> All four of those are, yeah, uh, victim reports, victim gets oversight, victim pays fines, victim perhaps has criminal charges. I'm, I'm going to bring up a point that I've heard, I don't know, probably 15 years ago, maybe yeah, at least 15 years ago, that uh, I don't know if you know Jeremiah Grossman uh, pitched this idea or presented this idea or concept of 
of security warranties. I think he calls it software warranties, but where the vendors claiming to provide the protections are liable to some extent for the failure of their systems to protect against what they're supposed to protect against, in this case, ransomware. Uh, I'm wondering if, what your thoughts on that. I know it's not part of what you wrote about. Just any thoughts yeah. on how that fits in, perhaps, as a, as a way to incentivize? There's actually an interesting effort right now in the federal in the federal government that where they're having uh, contractors that sell software to the U.S. government self attest that their security is uh, does what they say it does, right, and, and 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 meets certain security standards based on the NIST uh, SSDF, right? So, um, and so they're going to self attest to that, and then that puts them on the hook for being liable just by saying for, under the Fraud Act to, of selling it to the government. You've said that this thing does what you say it does. If it doesn't meet those standards, then you you you, uh, you get it. To me, that's probably a, a moving more a closer in the right direction than something we could do on ransomware payments, um, because on the ransomware payment side, I think it's it, it's going to be hard to figure out what failed and why it failed, and whether it's whose error it was, and right. if we have to do that for each case. Um, we're going to end up with a lot of litigation around that front, right? As opposed to, um, uh, you know, so so I don't think you get quite to the answer that you'd hope you would, um, even though I understand the desire to move more liability to the vendors themselves. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I would like to see a, more of a move towards um, us coming up with this, what the what the standards should be for software and having the companies commit to those standards and then um, holding them accountable for that separately from what happens to victims on the side of, um, of that. So the, 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 vic yeah. the victims might be able to, you know, have liability standards against the companies that, that, right. that, as well, but, you know, we're just trying to stop payments, right? That is the point is, yeah. you know, why don't you take the, you have a choice, you have a, you, you should, yep. You have a choice to protect yourself better and have levels of resilience, and you have a choice of uh, once you get hit, like do you do you fight or do you not fight? We're just we're just trying to tip the balance a little more towards the you should yeah. fight, right? And then so it's 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 somewhat of a different uh, set of discussions, even though it's a related feet area, right? Right. Yeah, so I have two two burning questions. One is uh, in relation to the standards and perhaps audits and certifications and whatnot, which I think might fit into the last point of your article in, in terms of exceptions, and there's probably more to it than, than what I'm thinking of there. And then the other is the role of cyber insurance in this e equation. I'm, do you have any thoughts there? I, so that, on the, that, on the standards side, as well. yeah, yeah. Um, on the standard side, um, the, uh, I think, um, uh, we, we, I look, you know, you look at the NIST cybersecurity framework and what the what profile would be for each sector and then have them work off of that. Like we've seen the FTC put, promote that idea in the past in these kind of situations. Um, I think that's probably the direction that I would put it toward, but I think we want to leave it open, you know, as time goes on, if, the, if these, these change. So I would leave it open to the FTC to kind of make that determination, but I personally lean towards the idea of continuing down the path that they've already started on and working with the NIST cybersecurity framework, which has generally been embraced for these kind of situations. And then, uh, for, you know, it, we, we also actually, we, they actually have a ransomware profile under the NIST cybersecurity framework. So you could just focus on the NIST, on the ransomware profile, right, which it works for any industry. Um, and then, uh, on insurance, I mean, I, I did leave that question out. Um, I, uh, I think that it's still a, a very good one. I, I, I sort of, um, uh, the more talking to the insurance company, some of the insurance companies after I published it, um, I've, I've uh, sort of gone back and forth a little bit about what, what the role should be. So I, I think um, there is a question as to whether you say, I think we, well, one thing we want to be sure of is that insurance doesn't cover everything involved here, that the government, the insurance isn't paying the government in particular, right? So maybe, it, like I was thinking, my first thought was we could have the insurance, you could still get insurance to cover the payment to the bad actor, right? 
even though it's, we consider it to be um, illegal in, in a civil sense, um, you, could, you could still get a coverage to do that if you need it. Um, I think we could also, but I think there's another approach to it too, where you say um, this, that the exemption is given in a case-by-case -case basis and it's based on loss of life or major economic harm. Right, and the government is making a determination about whether you have you would have loss of life or ma major economic harm, and then you could say, well, in those cases, companies that would, might be in those situations could get insurance, and but they would have to get the approval of the government in order to get the insurance, um, which I think would be you know that makes that insurance rarely used, um, but it does give people you know in s super terrible situations the ability to get it paid for. Um, so I'm still between those two kind of viewpoints on like what, how, do, how does insurance fit into this discussion. You don't want to be in the situation we were in 2020 where insurance was actually fueling uh, ransomware growth. Um, right. I think later on and that stopped and, and now we're, we're, we don't see that as much, but um, you don't want to be, I think we do worry about ransom, all everything being paid for by being able to be paid for by the insurance company. But the insurance company made it harder to pay, to get paid back recently and which is another reason people have gone away from paying so yep yep now this this wild idea and you, i don't know if you have thoughts on it or not but uh, perhaps the direct payment where the the decision to make the payment by the organization or by the victim might uh, to our to your points earlier it's right now it's the rational thing to do to make the payment to get out of the mess Perhaps if there's an immediate intermediary <laughs> that, that helps make that decision. I don't know if that's a, a commercial entity. I don't, I, don't, I don't know that I want to suggest that, but perhaps there's a government entity that, that that's the intermediary. At least then they can see what's going on and what the, who the actors are and what the impact might be and help make the decision. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, so there have been these, um, these intermediaries that have worked to negotiate the payments. And there's been some concern about those intermediaries. There's been some that have thought to have been too close to the bad actors and like grown too close to them and like worked out deals with them. Um, I haven't seen that from my side. The, the ones that we work with um, are very professional and actually um, definitely help bring down the prices in the ransoms and uh, tell people, you know, give people a lot of comfort about the steps that they're taking because they see so many of these and they know who the bad actors are. Um, so I actually think they help, but there has been some discussion about sort of um, certifying those kind of actors, making sure that they're, that the, that they're work actually working on behalf of the people, the folks involved, which I think is part of this. Um, yeah. But I think I was thinking more that, from the, if, if the government, I'll just say the government, so having a view into all of that. So more than just, yeah more than we made the payment and now we have to report. I'm thinking if they can be involved during the process, mm. during negotiation or even before payments made, they can learn a ton perhaps to help yeah, that's drive. That's true, that's true. I think um, uh, that's a possibility. Uh, I have to, it would have to be spelled out a little bit more what kind of cases they get involved because there are a lot of them. And then the question is, if they're forced to respond to all of them, you're gonna, you're ending up with a very large bureaucracy round. Uh, yeah. something that we're hoping to make go away. So uh, uh, exactly. like it's hard. And then, and then the bureaucracies like look for things to do after they exist. You know, you don't That's want to right. zombie uh, right. bureaucracy around there for trying to put them we out. We have to keep our place. jobs and keeps our, keep our budget. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, so I think that uh, I prefer, I like the idea of, the, of them responding to the reporting afterwards, using the reporting to do that. But if, mm -hmm. if we really feel that the, that the best way for to stop it and, and that, that might be a, a good approach so so what um what are some of the cases where an exception might be made assuming we get to a, a banned state i think where, something where like what we saw um you know we've seen in some of these cases with hospitals um where you've had hospitals that uh where it seemed like there was they're making a life or death decision uh, involved. I think, you know, Colonial Pipeline might be an edge case there where we, we felt like the economy was at risk, really at risk. Um, on that one in the past, you would, uh, 
I don't think the gov government wanted to be involved in making that decision, and they left it all to the company to make that decision. Uh, if you're forced the government to get involved, it might actually be a better decision made uh, in, in reviewing it. So um, whether whether they should pay or not. So um, um, I would prefer it to be the one. Like one of the reasons I like the idea of an independent regulator doing it is because I'd like to have a you know. A, commission vote on it rather than the FBI making that determination. Because what, what I've seen of the FBI making determinations in these kind of cases is that they don't want to get involved at all. Like their, their view is, you know, we're here to investigate and solve these crimes and we're not here to make the determination, like you have to make the decision. So they're almost never going to give an exemption for anything. Um, they don't want to be the one who's, who's put on the line and has to to make the determination of exactly when that happens. So it has to be in a totally extreme case for the in that kind of case. So I think in some ways it's more, more important who the um, one making the determination is, and they can come up with their sets of criteria around it. But I do think it would be a, a extreme case like a hospital or, a, 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 you know, a, th there have been cases where we've seen um, entire towns shut down or, or uh, state government shut down for long periods of time. Uh, so I think that, you know, well, what's the economic harm to the to that town and, and state and to make that determination? It might be worth keeping them down and have, have them kind of work their way out of it themselves uh, and not pay. Um, you know, I think we've seen we've seen governments successfully do that. So, but, you know, who we need to kind of so I don't want to say in every one of those cases, but I think you want to have that kind of balance review. Yeah. Yeah, the first thing that comes to mind is if it's critical and they get the exception, they become even a, an even bigger target because <laughs> right. the, the criminals know, well, those are the only ones that get to pay, so we may as well target them. You don't want to you don't want to move it more towards the life, life or death. I do think at that yeah. point, when you when you have had that happen to you, though, you they better like buck them up and make sure that they can withstand uh, yeah. attacks in the future as well as yeah. so big for that reason. Um, yeah. So, so I have a, a three-part question to, to close here, Ari. How, how likely and when do you think a ban might happen? And what, if any, blockers exist that need to be removed in order for it to happen? I can, I can start with those two if you want, and then I'll yeah. have the third. Yeah. I think I think that eventually it will happen. I think that countries will do it. I mean... We ban a similar situation as we ban payments to terrorists, uh, kidnappings, payments to terrorism, right? And pretty much most countries do that at this point. So uh, I think once you see one country start to do it and come up with a successful approach to it, it's going to, there, there'll be a dominoes. Uh, the, the other countries will pick up on that. Um, so the question is more like, you know, how long will that take? And I'm not totally sure, but I think probably within the next uh, three to five years, I'll start to see countries come up with uh, approaches on that. Um, and then I think we need a law passed in this case for it to happen because there's no one that really has the authority to do some of the things that I'm spelling out here. Um, even even if it were that they did take the criminal ban, you would have to add it to the list of things that were already existed in that criminal statute. So I think we probably, you probably need legislation and go through Congress in the U.S. for yeah. sure. You see that at, at the federal level versus the state I know some of the states have been aggressive for other things. Yeah, so it, it, a state could do it. Uh, I think it would be sort of weird. <laughs> like, yeah, <it would. laughs> you can pay this in California, but you can't pay it in right. Uh, Oregon, right? Like, so right. Um, that would be weird. But uh, it's, yep. it is, it, and I think people probably would push, you know, for uh, right. interstate, uh, you know, say so that it was unconstitutional because it it's interstate commerce involved here. Um, if, right. they're, if they're more involved, it, based in more than one state. So, um, but I think uh, uh, they could do it, a state could do it. So, but I think generally mm -hmm. speaking, a federal would be a lot more successful, especially for the types of things that I'm talking about, about building a program. Yeah. Because uh, those programs already exist in the federal level and most states don't have something like that. Yeah, makes sense. So a, a two A question before I get to three. And you mentioned other countries and one flips and the other would likely follow. Have you seen actions in other countries on this front that are- I mean, I've heard people, folks from the UK talk about it. Um, I think Australia has talked about it. Um, 
yeah, those are the two I think that have been the most active I've heard, where I've heard politicians talk about it in, in those countries. Um, uh, I'm sure there have been some others as well that have raised it, though. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. All right, the third question uh, for my for my listeners and, and watchers, what, uh, what should they prepare for? I mean, obviously, better protection, but three to five years, let's assume this happens, what, what should they start preparing? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, one thing is uh, that's obvious is don't assume that the insurance, that your insurance is going to save you on this front. Um, we've seen a lot of people who, um, where, where insurance isn't paying now as much as they used to, paying out as much as they used to. So even if you've seen cases where insurance is paid in the past, like the rules have changed, certainly, and, and the fact that less people are paying now means insurance is probably going to start paying less. Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, in the uh, larger society sense, is a good thing. But for your company, it means you got to do more risk mitigation beyond insurance, right? So, and and I think getting a message out to folks that you know you need to like look for uh, uh, ransomware protection and then also exercise for it. Um, I think you know, and exercise your backups, right? People forget <laughs> back up front that. Uh, yeah. You know, you actually have to uh, make sure that you it have works. To restore, right? <laughs> yeah, you have to be able to restore, uh, and not just that it, it copied over somewhere. <laughs> um, so that uh, we've seen a lot of failures on that front too. So I think those are the main uh, sets. But um, and, you know, segmentation, obviously, as I said before, too, being a big one in this in this regard too. So um, uh, I think those are the kind of mitigating factors, and then the, just the general. Uh, set cyber controls out there uh that, that uh, they're the same for ransomware as everywhere else i mean can, credential uh having good identity management procedures and credentials and credential protection um yep. and segmentation there too is really a key in this one too so yeah and i'll, I'll toss in i mean it, we all want this to diminish if not completely go away so whatever we can do to help do our part to help drive that i think we should figure out what that is i don't know what it is hopefully somebody else does but but don't fight it right or don't just don't just go with the flow because everybody else is or it, it seems the easiest it might cost a few extra bucks it might take a little extra time but i think the goal is to, to get this to, to go away somehow so yeah i mean in some ways i think it's been helpful for security companies that have not i mean for, for security entities inside companies that have not been hit to raise it because some like they know so many some almost everyone has been hit by ransomware in some ways or at least some kind of extortion attempt that it's easy to kind of get it to demonstrate the potential harm uh, from it to your organization so in that way i think we we should still use it and and uh um, try and use that to get the attention of leadership around it and get more money to uh get more resources towards towards this so there's almost an you know uh, uh it's it's a good way to get people capture people's attention yep yeah pay me now pay me later yeah <laughs> it's better yeah. better to take care of it ahead of time well ari uh really appreciate uh the conversation and your time uh talking to me about this topic and and for putting that that article together to uh to help drive it of course for folks listening and watching i'll put links to uh, your linkedin post and the and the blog post as well so they can all I'll follow up and read that and uh, perhaps connect with you if they have further questions. And uh, any final thoughts, Ari? No, I appreciate you having me, Sean. Thanks a lot. Good way to uh, keep pleasure. up the new year here. So. Exactly. Well, let's, let's move toward the band. So thanks, everybody, for, uh, for listening and watching. And uh, please subscribe, share with your friends and uh, enemies. And uh, we'll see you on all the future episodes here of Redefining Cybersecurity on ITSP Magazine. Cheers. Thanks. Devo unlocks the full value of machine data for the world's most instrumented enterprises. The Devo Data Analytics Platform addresses the explosion in volume of machine data and the crushing demands of algorithms and automation. Learn more at Devo.com. Imperva is the cybersecurity leader whose mission is to protect data and all paths to it with a suite of integrated application 
and data security solutions. Learn more at imperva.com. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Redefining Cybersecurity with Sean Martin, part of the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. If you learned something new and this conversation made you think, then share this show and ITSPMagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to connect your brand with our conversations, you can sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Insights, solutions, and networking all come together at RSA Conference. Join a global cybersecurity community at rsaconference.com forward slash ITSP MAG24.